Reposarás con los ojos cerrados, pero no dejarás de ver, no dejarás de desear. Recordarás, porque así harás tuya la cosa deseada. Hacia atrás, hacia atrás, en la nostalgia, podrás hacer tuyo cuanto desees. No hacia adelante, hacia atrás. La memoria es el deseo satisfecho. Sobrevive con la memoria, antes que sea demasiado tarde, antes que el caos te impida recordar. Welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. This is David. This is Eric. And today we'll be discussing The Death of Artemio Cruz by Carlos Fuentes. And we have a very special guest, Frida, from the Books of Some Substance book club meetups. Frida, welcome. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm very glad to be here. We're going to be discussing this book by Carlos Fuentes that is about a dying man remembering 12 days of his life his love, his passion, his corruption too. And that's what we are going to do today. All right. So uh, we can start anywhere, but uh, I, th I think we'll just start with a sort of general opinions of the novel as a whole. So uh, I'll start with you, Frida. <laughs> okay. Well, the book, I find it refreshing. Um, I think it's a novel that is very challenging to read. It's not easy, but I liked it. I think Even if it was uh, published 50 years ago, it still has something to say to us. So I, I think it's it was good. I mean, it's not my favorite thing I have ever read by Carlos Puentes, but I did like it. And um, I think it's beautifully written. I think that's the, the thing I enjoyed the most. Yeah, it's interesting, David. We talked a little bit about this and you had talked about how it started out really good for you and then it got sort of exhausting and convoluted. And I would say that my experience was almost the opposite. I was a little bit unsure of it as much as I liked some of the formal stylistic sort of things that he was doing with point of view. And at the halfway point, I was a little, you know, unsure about how this would ever, if this could ever sort of come together in a way that became more than the sum of its parts. And for me, it actually really did. I really enjoyed the way that the different strands came together. I, I really thought those The last half, especially the last third, was quite engaging and even quite moving. I think it's rare that a novel can um, fuse this sort of formal experimentation with kind of emotional engagement. And I think we talked, too, about how much like Wolf, um, I think Cruz fused it together, those two things pretty well together. I think in the, what's interesting about it is that I think Wolf does it in a very controlled way, like every sentence and every word seems very sort of intentional and labored over, where Cruz, for me, it was, it was, it was messier. It was a lot more visceral and maybe a, a lot more unnecessary words, you could argue. But I think collectively, I just by the end, it just really, it really did it for me. It affected me in, in ways that I think were surprising by the time I got to the end. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask how it, that affected you, because the only way that this moved me was as I progressed through it, I was moved towards exhaustion, <laughs> <laughs> frustration, anger at Artemio for being such a, quote unquote, piece of shit, <laughs> as I labeled him before we started recording. Yeah, yes. And though I did find the formal stylistic choices interesting, innovative, creative, Ultimately, uh, like I, I never felt any great emotional impact the way Eric seemed to. Well, maybe you did because you are feeling all this negative emotion. So I guess in some way it did affect you, but not in the way you would uh, approach a novel that is more, uh, I don't know, sensitive or happy ending <laughs> kind of thing. I think it did. It does affect us mm. because, I, I, again, as you said, I, I, I didn't experience all these uh, emotions, positive emotions for the character of Artemio. I felt I just hated him really badly because I, he's, he's a nasty person, honestly. Yes. But then again, I think if, if, if the book is, is causing this reaction on us, it might be because it has something good in it in some way. So my question is then, what purpose does that serve? 
why would an author want to make you feel that? And how is that a worthwhile reading experience for more than 150, 200 pages? Well, I think personally, I am drawn to literature that um, that focuses on very flawed beings and tries to humanize them. I think we've talked about this in books like Henderson, The Rain King, where you know, there are these very flawed protagonists that the author attempts to humanize and make us identify with. And you're right, David, this guy is horrible. Frida, you said this too. At the same time, this by, you know, weaving together these stories where we find out more and more about him, both horrible, but I would say also sort of innocent and human, you begin to see that you know, even the most despicable beings are still human beings that come from not maybe the same place, but maybe sort of start out of the start out as these innocents. And I think that last section when he was a teenage boy, and it both encapsulated this sort of this innocent humanity and this horrible humanity in one sort of section, I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't read it yet. And I'm sort of fascinated by authors that try to attempt this, um, this idea that even the most horrible people have this kind of core that started off, you could argue, innocent. And I think it's a much more challenging notion for literature to take on this burden of trying to humanize really bad people and why they're like that than the very easy way of the, the very sort of good sort of protagonist that we can instantly identify with and understand. And So I, I don't want to get too hung up on this because it's not, it wasn't like my main issue with the novel. I just want to go back. Did you find that final scene or one of the final scenes where we sort of get his childhood? I felt like the author was attempting to, at least in part, justify Artemio's behavior, I don't know if you want to call it evilness or nastiness, whatever you want to call it, throughout the first 300 or so pages. I don't think it's justifying it. You can you could see that if you read the novel as a naturalistic style <laughs> in the themes, because he came from uh, this social stratus that was just repeating itself in the next century. So if you read it like that, I guess you could say it's a justification of his uh, actions. But I do believe it's it has more to do with the uh, the human side that Eric was uh, saying. When If you caught those two days, the day uh, he's born and the day he, uh, he has this uh, thing happening to him when he was a teenager, if you caught those things, you basically end up with a human that has no humanity at all. And I think those two uh, days are very important for the novel because you can see a different side of Artemio, maybe a more human and loving or childish uh, Artemio that you don't see in the rest of the novel. I, I also think, you know, if, if we were to sort of peel this or, or deconstruct this novel and like put it back together in a linear fashion and take away a lot of the the more formally and stylistically um, adventurous parts of it, it probably would feel like a contrived story and it probably would leave you with the idea of like, why would we even want to possibly hear this guy's story or even possibly sympathize with him? But I think what was interesting is that by framing it you know, in this sort of the last days before he dies scenario, I think that's really what begins to connect me to it is that regardless of how good or how evil we are, a lot of us are going to die in this pretty horrible, you know, way. We're all going to the same place. And I think when you really get into the nuance, when he really gets into the nuance of, you know, dying and what that involves, it, you can't help but, I don't know, for me, it, it just, Going back to what Frida said, it brings this human element to it that regardless of how bad this guy is, it's hard not to have a little bit of empathy about what a horrible thing it is to sort of to die and die in such a way. I think that framing device of looking at it through the lens of 
death and how we go through it is is an interesting way to kind of get us into this person in a way that we might be able to identify with him a little bit more if as opposed to just telling his story in a very linear way and and not such an acutely detailed and and um emotional way and I think that we would not be as engaged. And I think that, to me, is what's an interesting aspect of the novel, is not only is this person dying, but he's a horrible person. But can we still have empathy for this person? Because the way he's describing it is horrible. And I just didn't feel like he deserved it as bad as he was. you know. And I think that's a testament to maybe the author taking this on and, and, and doing it in this manner. I think that's a testament to your good morality because I was like, yeah, he deserves, he deserves it. it. Yeah, Fuck him. he deserves it. <laughs> wow. Well, he in some way he he did uh, get what he deserved because he 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 doesn't get love at all. All his uh, power is reduced when he's dying. He doesn't have any power even to open the window. So I do believe in some way there's. Uh, a revenge or karma there <laughs> happening sure absolutely there's there's karma there and i don't want to i don't want to i don't want to make myself sound like i'm or you guys make me sound like i'm this better moralist, moralist. But- i just think maybe it's more just i'm i think what fuentes does for me is that there's a lot of times in this novel about you know when you learn more about his story it's like it he's not so exceptional in his horribleness, you know, he's part of this army that is going in and killing people and raping the female villagers. He's part, he's, you know, he's, he's seeing these landowners and what they have done before him that I'm sure is equally as bad. And it, it's almost, I don't want to say he's a victim of circumstance, but I guess I'm not surprised. He doesn't seem exceptional in his evil considering the context of what they've, they've set up. Yeah, it was violent times. It wasn't, He's a man of his century, I guess, and he's a Mexican man <laughs> also, which is something I must address because he he represents a lot of how um, identity is in Mexico in some way. Um, so because uh, Carlos Fuentes wasn't just writing about this guy uh, living the first 15 years of the century. Um, he had some other ideas from philosophers and even you can see it in the epigraphs of the novel. Uh, I do believe he has a moral idea that he's he's always uh, building in the novel. Um, he has this uh, Montaigne uh, no, um, epigraph that comes from an essay about philosophy or death as a philosophy. And I do believe you, if you read that, you can see that Carlos Fuentes was addressing in some way this uh, aspect of how we look back into our lives and if we see all these things we have done, what outcome, what moral outcome would would, would be? Uh, would, would, would we think we were nice person, good persons, or not? So I I don't I don't think it's a moralist just just a moralist thing about uh, Eric is just saying I do believe there is a uh, something deeper in the novel that uh, it's about that it's about moral issues. Maybe you can touch a little bit more on why the setting and the character in terms of place and time is so important because for me being so distant from that history. I found myself questioning what is Fuentes trying to say about this man at this time? Because it does, it seems like he is an exceptional man because I think he represents this powerful figure of the time. I think he's exceptional in his greed and his evilness because he rises to such heights. He controls newspapers. He controls all these different things. He's like a Mexican Citizen Kane sort of feel to him. Yes, I agree. (laughs) But my distance as a reader, being from America, not knowing this history, I don't know is Fuentes trying to say something about this time, about the the failure of the revolution, that it was 
filled with these sort of greedy, greedy, selfish people, and that's why history went the way it did. Well, Carlos Fuentes only said for himself that he wasn't doing any moral or social criticism. He was just writing the story of a man dying. But I did, I think he said that because uh, when the novel was published, it was heavily criticized because of the things he he wrote, right, about the revolution and the uh, social class that became powerful. And even there are uh, intellectuals, Mexican intellectuals, that addressed that. And they said that basically the novel was being critical about something. So as a reader, as a Mexican reader, I, I think the cultural and historical aspect of the novel is important, of course. But I think you can understand the novel either way, even if you don't have the context. Of course, if you know about what happened in the 19th century and then what <laughs> what outcomes came with it, you can, of course, understand the novel better. But I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a thing you have to know. I was curious if Fuentes was trying to say something specifically to... Mexican readers or two readers that are familiar with that history. Well, would you say maybe he's picking things from Mexican history that speak to maybe more universal things? I mean, I think that the interesting thing about the book for me is that it was both, I think I said this already, both intimate and epic to a certain degree. Like he was getting a lot of this pretty big sweep of history in this book, yet it stays so focused on Artemio that it has this wonderful sort of, to me, tack between the epic and the intimate, which I think very few books tend to do. But there was one section that he wrote, it sums up at least a little some of the political stuff here. It says, a revolution starts in the battlefield, but once it gets corrupted, even though military battles are still won, it's lost and we're all to blame. We've let ourselves be divided and directed by the lustful, the ambitious, the mediocre. Those who want a real, radical, and transigent revolution are unfortunately ignorant, bloody men, and the educated ones only want half a revolution, compatible with the only thing they really want, to do well, to live well, to take the place of Don Porfirio's elite. And I thought that that's a pretty good summation (laughs) of revolutions, Mexican or not. And yeah. I was even thinking like today, the reason that we have in some ways where we are now politically is that, you know, all of us are really angry about Trump's election, but we're kind of half-assed about it because we still want to have our nice coastal elite lives. I'm going to say we, just being me. <laughs> well, I cannot say anything about American politics, but I can. I do know what happens in the rest of the world and what most revolutions end up with is the same thing they were fighting before the revolution. Yeah, it's very true. If you see uh, Slavok Šišek's commentaries on revolutions, you can see exactly that. That He says that when a revolution starts, yeah, yeah, everybody's excited and everybody has an opinion and things are happening, right? But after that, no, not so many are speaking about it because apparently, you know, there's nothing happening. The things that we, that happened before are just repeating itself. And that's not just a Mexican thing. It's part of history of humanity. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that, that's true. Usually you end up with something the same or worse. And then you also yeah. end up losing a lot of intellectuals. And depending on where the revolution takes place, I mean, you can lose a couple thousand to, you know, a couple million or tens of millions of people in the process right which which we've been we talked about before and with the the chang book yeah yeah i think you're right i think he's you know even though this is set at a very specific time and place he's trying to or at least as a reader it's easier to to see it as universal themes of war corruption these are the these are the things that people go through I mean, one question I have for you, Frida, specifically, is that you hinted at it, but there there definitely is the way women are used and treated in this novel is, at least for me in this day and age, a little unsettling. A little? Yeah. It's quite <laughs> unsettling. It is horrible. It is. I agree. But what's the, what's the question? Oh, I'm just curious from your vantage point of reading this as a woman, okay. you know, how do you feel about it? 
Okay, so being a woman and being Mexican, this is a complex thing to explain to anybody who is not Mexican <laughs> or a woman. So the first thing is, I live in the 21st century. This book was written in the 20th century, and it speaks about a mentality that comes from far away. <laughs> so I, I think it's unsettling and it can be enraging, frankly, because many, many things, abuse is happening in the novel towards women. They don't have any power and they are basically objects, either of desire or uh, property or whatever. So it is very unsettling and um, it's not something I would love to go through, of course. But I do think we have to see it as... Uh, <laughs> Uh, as a description of what was happening at the time. Because even if I don't agree about the things men did in the past, I, I cannot close my eyes and just ignore what happened before. So this for me is a reminder of what was to be a woman in that age. If you think that the book was published in 1962, uh, yeah, you might think, oh yeah, women had rights at the time. Well, no. In Mexico, women gained right to vote, only to vote, in 1955. So it was a very new thing to happen, you know, for women to have rights to vote. And other things uh, ha were happening at the time, too, that were restricting for wom women. And even now, in modern Mexico, many, many things are happening against um, women's rights. So... If you read the novel and you're a woman, yeah, you must be enraged. I, I, I hope you are. It, it tells good things about you. But again, see it as a, as a description of things that should never happen again. I mean, uh, the, the, the section that I'm thinking of specifically that I think addressed this was that, that whole fucked mother soliloquy that he did in the middle, right? And it was just kind of interesting to me that it just... It was an interesting passage, right? Because on the surface you could say, oh, he's kind of trying to excuse himself at the same time. It seems to be a, a larger statement on what you're talking about. And uh, I don't know. I'm curious to know what people thought about that passage in, in respect to just what you just talked about. David, what did you think about this passage? I'm going to sound contrarian, but I, I was bored by it. <laughs> <laughs> felt like I was listening to my punk rock teenage brother yes i was like oh, okay yeah all right i get it you're angry it just felt it felt repetitive <laughs> but it made me appreciate the and various uses of the word fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i'll give you my insight um the novel has a problem for you or for anybody who's not mexican and does not speak or has any contact with Mexican Spanish. The novel uses a very colloquial style. So in some areas of the novel, you can find things that are basically, that have no translation because, uh, because of the colloquial style. So one of the things that I really loved in Spanish is called uh, La Chingada. Th this, this specific uh, thing is important for me as a Mexican because of several uh, reasons. One, it's translated as fuck, but, but it's not exactly that. That word, chingar, is a very Mexican word. It doesn't exist in any other variant of Spanish. So that's one thing that is important to just address. The second thing is that the word chingar has many, many different uses in Mexico, and it can be like horrible, and it can be good too. So, and it's used in a very... Uh, in everyday conversations, even for people who are not vulgar or uh, teenager <laughs> cursing, it's it's um, it's used in many many different uh, situations, or it's all over really. So this specific chapter for me was important because it recollected all the uses you can uh, do of the word, but also uh, about identity, Mexican identity. There's a uh, an essay by. Uh, Octavio Paz, which is a Mexican writer, philosopher, and poet, where he addresses this topic because he says that Mexicans have a problem with it, their identity and they don't accept the violent and horrible past they have. As a Mexican, you have to remind yourself that you, are, you were conquered 
by Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, soldiers, by Spanish uh, culture. And then again, the outcome of it, it's a mestizo. It's a mixed breed. So even if you don't want to, you're a mix. You're in between two cultures. So you cannot identify with either of them. And this lack of definition is a problem because most people identify with Spanish, the Spanish aspect, and not with the indigenous American traditions. So for this specific chapter, I do believe he was doing some kind of echoing this idea of Octavio Paz and even from other writers, from Samuel Ramos too, there's a, a, another philosopher about Mexican identity, about this lack of ident identification of the true self. And again, I don't think this is uh, specifically about Mexicans. It's I think it's about every culture because no culture is absolutely pure. We are a mix of things and a mix of a historical outcome, right? So I did like this Chingada um, <laughs> chapter because of that. And then the other thing I wanted to say, uh, just to wrap it up, is that the, the two translations uh, existing in, uh, of the book are very different. Most of the things there are lost from the original one because there's no translation to it. I could I could explain to you what it means, but it's it, there are things that are not possible to translate. I think there's a, there's a quote where he says, I think in English it says something like, my little fucking children or something like that. But in Spanish, it has nothing to do with it. What it says is chingaderitas mias, which means... <sighs> Something like my fucking things, my little fucking things, but it, it doesn't translate accurately. And you can uh, see that <laughs> clearly because that's in one translation. In a, the second translation, there's none. That expression is not translated. So again, I, I do believe there's something there uh, that is very cultural that uh, would require the translator to do either uh, an equivalent, <laughs> literary equivalent for every culture, uh, or very, a uh, very detail, in detail note about, <laughs> about the uses of, of this verb in Spanish, in Mexican Spanish. So I hope that helps. Uh, and if you're reading a translation, well, try to search for the second translation because maybe the, the one you're reading is not the best one. Maybe. Because I feel like I, I sound like I hated all of this book, but I didn't. So I'd like to move on to something <laughs> something I actually really enjoyed, which was – so the novel is sort of divided into three narratives. The, the first person in the present of him dying, the third person narrative, which is still limited third. It's him sort of remembering these things. And then this second person, you, that sort of gets into – and here maybe we can kind of decide what this is trying to do. But I, I found those sections to be the best because they they were the most philosophical. I thought they were the most well-written. And it was the part that really played with the idea of the purpose and power of memory and how we shape our memories and what memory means when we are dying, how it might be the only thing that we have on our deathbed, all of us. And I'd like to just kind of talk about that. What, what did you think about it? What do you think this book is trying to say about memory? These are my questions for you. Those are some big questions, to say the least. But yeah, I mean, I think part of my enjoyment and appreciation of this book was the sort of three different point of view narrative kind of techniques. I, I would agree the you sections were, for me, both alternately the best and often the most annoying to read. And I think that's why <laughs> they're so successful is that they straddle that line so well. And you're right, the philosophical nature of it. I think it's also those philosophical asides that maybe open the book up and the character up a little bit more. And what, you know, we've used this word a lot, but humanizes him a bit more. And, and places this book in this bigger context of really grappling with more universal things like 
you said death, memory. I mean, I, I think I, I found myself very much identifying with how when we're young, these str- we're much more susceptible to these str- to feeling things a lot more strongly. And so those memories, those really strong, important memories stick with us. And I began to think about like, yeah, there are these things from when I was a teenager or when I was in my 20s that still resonate super strongly and I, and um, that don't go away. And I, the way that he was trying to grapple with, you know, nostalgia and the way we think about these things and, we try to shake them, but they inevitably shape our lives well into middle age because that's where I am. And uh, I thought it was, to me, very resonant and very true. And the way he stylistically kind of got at that, it wasn't just the content of the of the writing. It was that stylistic, formal way that he got at those things. I, to me, it was probably what makes the book most of substance for me, grappling with these big issues, but in ways that were unexpected and very creative. Yeah. There's a passage I know that you you wanted to discuss. Can you read that? Are you talking about the the memory is satisfied desire that one? Yeah, that's a good that's a good yeah. Yeah. No, that is that's one of the sections I tagged. It I'll read just the last part of that. It says you will rest with your eyes closed, but you will not stop seeing. You will not stop desiring. You will remember because that way you will make the desired thing yours back, back in nostalgia. You will make yours whatever you desire, not forward, back. Memory is satisfied desire. Survive through memory before it's too late, before chaos keeps you from remembering. I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty powerful conceit there. I know that we were arguing earlier about, you know, memory is satisfied desire. Is that true or is that just some sort of or completely not true. It's more of a justification of his, the way he acts in his worldview. But I, I think the the general thing it's getting at is pretty powerful to me. You know, this idea of that, especially in my, you know, in my in the creative, you know, streams that I go and then you know, nostalgia and looking back is always like anathema, right? Yet that stuff is meaningful and powerful too. And so there's this reconciliation of how do we move forward. But at the same time, you know, still acknowledge that these things from our past are powerful and, and dictate who we are and what we do. Anybody else want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, the idea of memory is interesting because, at least in the novel, the only narrator we have is Artemio all the time in in his three voices, but we only have his side of the story. We don't have the side of Regina or we don't have the side, the story from Catalina. We don't know what they thought or how we, they saw her, uh, him through his life. So in that sense, I think, uh, yes, memory is a d- satisfied desire because, you know, even if if you have lived something nobody can take away that from you unless you have alzheimer or some kind of disease that just uh, makes your memories go away right but the things you have in your memory are yours and since they are yours you can actually edit them in the way you want to remember them so in some way it's a satisfied desire because you had what what you had is yours and it will always be yours. But at the same time, you can, in some way, go back and maybe overlook some things and just forget about some other stuff. And in the end, you what you actually remember, it isn't exactly what happened. So I guess I think, uh, yeah, memory is a satisfied desire. Well, I think it be, it becomes one as you decide what memories you want to hold on to and how you will shape them. And I think what's really interesting is watching him shape his memory as he, as he tells his story. Right. So he, he kind of avoids certain things or in his death, certain memories are inescapable, right? We see the line that is repeated throughout the novel. I met him. What is it? I met him at the river at dusk or something like that. 
at dawn. Yeah. It's this memory that this line that appears from the very beginning of the book and you never really get an idea of what it is until the end and you realize, oh, he had a son and he feels this sense of guilt for how his son lived and died. Yes, but you don't actually, you're in the book, you don't actually have the, uh, the grief of the father, right? I'm not going to go into detail, but you don't actually see him suffering. You only have this permanent idea going back to his mind when he's agonizing, but you don't actually see him mourning his son. No, you don't really see him feeling anything, honestly. No, in some way, yeah, he's editing, you know, his memory there. He's only remembering some things about this uh, very traumatic thing happening to him, but he's, uh, he's not going into detail about this memory because maybe it's too painful or whatever you Well, when you want, learn about right? his life, you realize that maybe why he has desensitized himself to so much, yes. right? And it, it makes a lot of sense. And going a little afield, there's this documentary on the musician Nick Cave called 20,000 Days on Earth, and he's asked this question, you know, why do you still play this song, Deanna, which is like, I don't know, 30 years old at this point. Why do you still play it in your shows? You know, because obviously you're talking about somebody in a time very specific and, you know, it seems to us like it's about nostalgia. And he's like, that, you know, playing that song over and over is not about nostalgia for him. He just said that it's not that I want to go back to that time and be with that person. But the, that song symbolizes to me and allows me to access these memories and feelings that I feel help me in my everyday life today. And what I'm trying to access are those feelings, not so much going back to that time. And I thought that distinction was very interesting because he's obviously using that song still to access or, you know, purge something in the present day, but he's not necessarily wanting to go back and relive it and be stuck in that time. He just wants to access those feelings, especially when he was a lot younger and a lot more open to those things. And a lot of people have said, oh, I don't see that as distinction at all, but I really do. And I think that that's what this book in some ways is sort of also saying like we have these memories and these things we go through how do we when we reaccess them or how do we use them in the present and i think that this book subtly is sort of grappling with that idea yes i i what you asked about uh, uh david you asked about the narrator uh, the, the voices i do believe the second person narrating is basically like the equivalent of the uh, chorus in the car in the uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a good way to think about uh, it. In the, uh, like the Greek, Greek tragedy, in the yeah. Greek cra tragedy, mm -hmm. because it's saying all the things that are going to happen and in this moral way, in this uh, very uh, severe tone. But also, I, I think I like those specific <laughs> uh, chapters more because it's a more poetic and more uh, risky writing. Uh, in some way, it's it's more creative. It, even in the uh, punct punctuation, is is very unsettling because you don't actually know why he's using <laughs> all these styles. But but I I do believe there's beauty in it. It can be very boring for people who are not into poetry, <laughs> but I do like it. Uh, so I, I enjoyed it a lot, and it made me realize, you know, this moral aspect of a novel i guess yeah it's one of the few times where you get a sense of honesty and reality because i i don't know if he is choosing to go to these memories i think these memories are sort of bubbling up to the surface and he can't ignore them now that doesn't mean he's remembering them exactly as they were but he's i think that's what's make it interesting he's sort of fighting against them sometimes because these lines will repeat and he'll call out regina's name but he sort of fights against the reality that the reader gets hints of. He's he he can't control what comes up. He can only control how he how he holds on to the memory or what he thinks he remembers from those times. Well, it's almost a Freudian breakdown of the psyche. I thought you know those yous are sort of like yeah. the id. You know the the present when he's dying is sort of the ego, and then these memories that come back of these different stories are kind of the superego, right? The sort of subconscious memories that are coming to the fore and um and i just found it kind of interesting as you know the different sort of triads whether you know 
that the fact that there's three points of view, there's a little bit of that discussion in it. There's, you know, a religious undertones is, is brought up a little bit in it. And then just thinking about, you know, to me, going back to that instruction, that Freudian philosophy thing that I had in college, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. These kind of breaking the psyche up into these three parts. And, and it's this fractured mental time that Fuentes is again playing with that I think is so interesting. And I'm all, I'm always intrigued by how authors tackle this, what I call idea of mental time that this 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 sort of how our minds sort of actually process and perceive the world is never the super contained linear thing and i'm always intrigued by how different authors try to attack that idea and you know again i go back to that's probably what's most appealing about this novel to me is the way that fuentes tries to attack it in that very fractured triplet narrative sort of way any other thoughts about that, or do we do we do we end with the sort of question that um, we always ask of I, this I have, podcast? I have an advice oh, to readers: good. if you are struggling with uh, the narrative, that the styles, I would have, if you are the kind of person that reads um, historical novels and enjoys them, I would advise you only to read the, uh, the chapters that are in third person first. And then maybe all the chapters in the first person and maybe go back and read the second person because that way you would have a more, in some way, a more uh, organized uh, novel to read, a more fun novel to read. Are you proposing like a hopscotch sort of Cortazar way of well, yes. two ways of, of reading course. the novel? <laughs> yes, of course, because it... I mean, it's a it's a it's a novel with a very traditional uh, theme, with a very romantic approach, honestly, in the first, in the in one of the voices, and then maybe a more modern one in the second, in the um, in the present uh, time, and then a more poetic and disjoint language <laughs> in the second person. So I do believe, since it's a novel, idea. it's a modern novel, you can read it pretty much whatever you want, in, the, in any <laughs> way you want. And that way it might be uh, more interesting to you because you're not, it's not like you're going to lose something if you read it in a different way. They, books don't have an instruction manual to read, to read. And even if they have, you can read it whatever, in whatever way you prefer. So I do advise That's very you. very postmodern. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I do advise uh, readers who are struggling with this, uh, maybe to do, uh, to do this experiment because it can help you not to lose track of the, of the things that are happening, but also to enjoy it a little bit more. David, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I I don't know how much that would change. Because for me, I think the biggest issue was that I felt the book was just too long, honestly. It, um, is, it is long. I agree. So I would recommend read it however you want, obviously. I, I think you can do that <laughs> with this book. But also yeah. to read it quickly. I think I spent too much time with it. I read it in starts and stops over, you know, about a month just because things have been hectic and maybe that affected my my pleasure, but I th I think if you were to read this quicker, you might get more out of it. Yeah, I mean, cuz I think it's almost like a fever dream the entire yeah. book. Yes. And I read the f like I literally read the first half like in one day cuz I had to cuz we had our meeting for the halfway point and then I literally read the last 125 130 pages in the last two, like day and a half. And so I think that in some ways by doing that, I got caught up in the sort of fever dream quality of it. And I think maybe that's why um, – it's also I just finished it, so maybe that's another reason why possibly I haven't really had time to process it. And just to me, that in the moment visceral quality of it, to me, was very appealing. Like I really got into that part. And for me, I – I didn't think it was over long. I sort of liked that the mosaic, you know, that you got this full sort of mosaic portrait of him. And it's interesting that you said 12. I mean, that, that's got to be intentional, these 12 sort of stories that he picked out. I, I just felt like for me it was – it gave me enough of his story that 
but not so much that it was overwhelming. And, um, you know, to me, it was the length was actually pretty good. To me, it's one of those books that um, it's, you know, if, if somebody's dying and their mind is falling away, it is going to be overlong. It is going to be messy, right? And I think that you have to kind of accept that as part of the concept of the book. And in contrast, again, to Wolf, where I feel like there are these like 225, sometimes 185-page novels that are just so considered and so packed but not long. This book is almost the opposite, where it's pushing the limits of how much is necessary. But, you know, if you're dying against the light, you're going to want a little bit more, I think. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think that shows there's there's a bit of desperation to to really – fully explore the end yeah i think it's it, it could be a little bit shorter but i do prefer short uh i think short tor- stories are better from carlos fuentes but but i think it, it it has a purpose to get you bored in some way <laughs> in some in way some, okay. in some way the novel wants you to feel what he's feeling and he's feeling uh yeah his time is expanding in some way because he's in pain and when you're in pain you feel time just bends basically i think he expects you to skip things like that new year's eve party where they went through like all the people in the the conversation (laughs) of snippets you know it's like yeah he's expecting you to sort of probably skim through that but the length of it is making a point about time right about the way that the mind sort of absorbs things and filters some things out and sometimes extends it um, you know, I found that stuff interesting and, and not too much personally, but okay. I just found it pointless, I guess. <laughs> Is it pointless though, David? Is it pointless? Well, look, it, it yeah. felt like pointless adherence to reality. You know how sometimes authors are like, Oh, I want you to, I want to put you in the real experience of time moving this way. It's like, yeah, I don't need that. I live that and it's dull. Well, wait, but maybe it's important to know it's dull because um, I'm going to go back to this epigraph by Montaigne because I really liked it. What he says is that if you're enjoying life, just enjoying life, purely having fun, happiness is everywhere, you're not actually, re- you know, having any insight in your life because you have to look into your suffering, into death to actually be more aware of life. It's not like you're pessimistic and you, but you have to be aware of these things. Just, and again, I think it's the same with time. If you don't um, stop for a moment to realize that happy times go really fast and miserable times are invariably slow. If you don't stop to, to think about it, you might, you might not be, uh, having a true experience of of life that's a i think a wonderful note to maybe close this out on um with the with the added thing that yeah i think that you hit the nail on the head i think that you know it's the classic dictum an unexamined life is not worth living and even if artemio cruz is this horrible guy and he's not teasing out the right lessons from his life at least he's thinking about it oh (laughs) see sometimes i think an examined life is worth losing and an examined life is worth losing no i really like losers uh stories so i i I like it i like it i i think mystery is important uh to look into yeah i'm a gen xer so i believe that to the hundred percent yeah i i just I'm on the camp of, yeah, I got enough of that. But but again, I, that's not to say that this book is nothing but that. Because I think it does have moments of beauty and insight into it's the function of memory and what we hold on to in our dying moments and how that humanizes all of us. I, I think that is an important thing to read about and understand. Yeah, because it would be artificial just to think about the happy, nice times, you know? Of course. Yeah. And I think you you touched on something, and we we only kind of briefly mentioned it early, but this book, especially early on in the novel, I think makes you confront your mortality better than a lot of other books I've read. Yeah. 
when he's being shifted and sort of manipulated while semi-conscious. It, it's yes. Yeah. yes, it's not a nice thing to even for uh, some uh, members of the book club mentioned this. It's not something you stop thinking about that maybe in your old age you won't be able to do things for yourself and you will depend on other people for simple things just to go to the bathroom is going to be an issue in your old age maybe so it's not something we stop thinking about as much and this book makes it very in a very very visceral way how we're going to suffer and we're going to die so it's, We're all going to the same place. Which is very sad and horrible to read. But <laughs> but I think it's important um, to see it as something, as again, as Montaigne said, uh, to have a better life, to have a more uh, full and uh, good life as a human being. Yeah, I mean, there's always that, you go back to that Mon Montaigne quote and, you know, we're always talking about how, how to live better. His whole thing was how to live better. But, you know, we're dying the second we're born. And there's an argument to be made that it's it's about dying better, too, right? It's about learning how to die better, too. And I think this book, for someone who is a decade older than you, probably at least, and I don't, maybe a decade older than David, it's certainly something that, you're right, put that very front and center as someone whose parents are still alive that are probably thinking about this. And why wouldn't I start thinking about this where I am too? And uh, that that's a powerful thing that um, not a lot of literature tackles in, in the visceral, direct way that this book does. And maybe that's maybe what I appreciate about it most, however despicable and awful this character ultimately is. You mentioned seeing this and looking at how to live and how to die. And I kind of want to end reading, I think, one of my favorite quotes, which maybe we can talk about it or just leave it. But it's about choice and how we make the choices and how we can't go back on those things or become a different person. He says, you will choose in order to survive, you will choose. Choose among the infinite mirrors, one only, one only, one that will reflect you irrevocably that will fill other mirrors with a dark shadow, kill them before offering you, once again, those infinite roads of choice. You will decide. You will choose one of the roads. You will sacrifice the others. You will sacrifice yourself as you choose. You will stop being all the other men you might have been. You will wish other men, another man, to carry out for you the life you cut off when you chose. When you chose, yes. When you chose, no. When you let not your desire, identical to your freedom, but your intelligence, your self-interest, your fear, and your pride lead you to a labyrinth. That labyrinth being, of course, other choices. And how each one cuts off all possibility, right? And I thought that was a really powerful little, little statement on just how, going back to Kundera, the unbearable lightness of being is. Yeah. And the choices we make. Yeah, that's what... Uh, being a free human is uh, I think Sartre was the one that said that that's a terrible thing about being a human you're free and that's a tragedy because you have to be aware that what you decide is only your uh, responsibility so that sounds like a perfect way to end When I read out loud, I tend to go where it is. Nah.